run a leash. Hi everybody, welcome. Oh, there it is. Um, hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Adam Greenfield. I'm the director of New Play Development at Playwrights Horizons. Um, thank you so much for joining us today for this panel discussion about Sarah Rule's play Stage Kiss. Um, this is the third panel in a new series that we started this year. Basically, we um, ask um, each playwright in our season who they would most like to speak to about the play that they wrote, and, uh, and then we make that happen for them. Um, uh, also, I'm very happy to mention that uh, this discussion is uh, it caught the interest of HowlRound, which is a website um, that uh, offers many platforms for the discussion of theater ideas and practices, and they're live streaming um, this event tonight. So there's a camera up there, and if you all wave to it, somebody at home uh, sitting in their living room is probably gonna wave back. Um, so uh, I'd like to really quickly introduce our wonderful panel, and uh, while I'm doing that, uh, maybe take a minute to make sure your cell phone is turned on. Um, on the stage at the left end of the table is Hamish Linklater. Hamish is an actor all over town and on both coasts. He's currently in the TV show The Crazy Ones and The Newsroom. Uh, this summer you can see his Benedict in What to Do About Nothing in Central Park. Uh, and later this year you'll see him in Woody Allen's film Magic in the Moonlight. He's also a playwright. His play The Vandal premiered last year at the Flea. And earlier today, Clarence Horizons held a reading of his play John and Anne upstairs on the fifth floor. Uh, to Hamish's right is Kathleen Chalfont. Uh, if we were to list Kathleen's acting credits, we would take up the full hour. Um, you may have seen her in the play Wit, uh, Angels in America, Somewhere Fun, or Dead Man's Cell Phone here on this stage. Um, or you may have seen her on both the big and small screens, and um, ranging from films Kinsey and The Last Days of Disco, to the TV series Storm of the Century, and House of Cards. Um, to my left is Anthony uh, Charo Lostra. Anthony is moderating today's panel. He's a child adult. <laughs> he's, a, he's, no, he's a fully grown man. He's a, <laughs> he's a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist. He's an assistant professor of child psychiatry at the NYU Child Study Center. He also maintains a full time private practice in Manhattan, and in his free time, he's married to Sarah Rule. Uh, in the middle of the table is uh, Esther Perel. Esther Perel is a psychologist recognized as one of the world's most original and insightful voices on couples and sexuality. You may have seen her enormously popular TED Talk, or you may have read her book, Mating in Captivity, Unlocking Erotic Intelligence, which has been translated into 25 languages. And uh, right here, of course, is Sarah Rule. Uh, Sarah's plays include In the Next Room, or The Vibrator Play, The Clean House, Passion Play, Dead Man's Cell Phone, Melancholy Play, Eurydice, Orlando, Dear Elizabeth, Late A Cowboy Song, and of course, Stage Kiss. Um, these guys are gonna talk to each other for a little while, and then uh, uh, at some point we'll turn the questions over, uh, we'll turn, turn the discussion over to questions from you guys. And uh, I'd like to thank the panelists for being here today, and thank you all, and also thank the people on the internet. And um, I will stop talking now and uh, sit down. Thanks. Thank you, Adam, um, and thank you again to um, our panel guests for uh, their time tonight. And um, so, just to kind of jump right into it, um, I wanted to ask each of the panelists if you have a story about um, a stage kiss, a kiss you did in performance. I'm sure that for Hamish <coughs> and for Kathleen, you probably have more than one, but Esther and Sarah, you may have one or two. <laughs> and um, uh, I thought it might be a good way to get the discussion going, to um, if you could share perhaps um, your best and or your worst story of a, of a, of a kiss in performance. And uh, I see why Hamish, when, if, <laughs> I'll give you a moment to gather yourself. Uh, I did a play right here on this very stage called The Busy World is Hushed, and I had like a big embrace with a very hot young man uh, named Luke McFarlane, and on my 30th birthday, I was given probably the performance of my life, uh, because it was sort of like a, you know, it was an important day. I was acting the shit, I mean, I was like transcendent. I was so fucking in the zone. I understood what Michael Jordan was doing all those years. And then uh, we had this little uh, kiss that we had at the top of the second act, 
uh, upstate in front of this window. The stars and the moon are out in front of it. And uh, the kiss was, you know, it was a deep mouth. We were lovers. We loved each other. And there was a deep loving kiss. But it was, you know, a very close mouth kiss. But uh, for uh, my 30th birthday, he had told all the crew that he was going to French me. <laughs> and so everyone was waiting in the, in the sides there. And, and he stuck his thick tongue in my mouth uh, right up there. And I was shot out of the zone. And uh, that performance was lost forever. So I, was, was, I, that your, was that your best or your worst? Yeah. Combo. Your I have a follow-up, though. I yeah. really do. So when actors are kissing on stage, they don't necessarily do tongue? Well, I think it's a conversation. I mean, formally, if you're having a formal, you, you have a formal conversation before sometimes where you're like, well, how would you like it? And what are you com what are you comfortable with? And or, oh, let's just go for it. And you know, it's the same with sort of you set ground rules. I think if you're professional, but actors are very rarely professional, so uh, <laughs> a lot of different things can happen. But I, do, you know, you're like, well, in this rehearsal, are we going to do it? We're going to have it. We're going to get it started, or maybe we just do it in the first stage reading and. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's nebulous. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, Kathleen? Oh, well, let's see. I'm very old, you may have noticed. So, in many, the, I, I, well, I t well, I preface it by saying that um, the reason, I, one of the reasons, I wanted to do re become an actor for two reasons about the time I was seven years old, which was lost now in the midst of time, but. Um, one of the reasons was that I wanted to ride horses, <laughs> and the other reason was that I wanted to be kissed because I imagined that in the natural course of things, <laughs> no one would ever kiss me. So, uh, um, so in an odd way, in some way, I never got to, I've never either in the movies or the television or on the stage ever gotten to ride a horse. <laughs> 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 I realized after it had been going on for some time that I have been mostly kissed by other women. Yeah. It, uh, all the most, the deepest and most passionate experiences on the stage of my life um, have been kissing other women, which is not something that I do a whole lot in real life. So it was very interesting, and I began, you know, you wonder why why that would why that is the case, and then and then. Finally, you just um, lean back and enjoy it. <laughs> and I have to say that one of the most enjoyable versions of that, which went on for many, many years, because we, Ellen McLaughlin and I were involved in Angels in America one way and another for six years, so it was a while for Paris Troika to get written, to be uh, kissed by and then um, have an orgasm caused by this kiss, <laughs> by a gigantic angel flying out of the sky <laughs> in great black wings, um, was pretty amazing stuff. So that was pretty great. I have to say, I think maybe that was... The, and then, uh, in an odd way, when I finally was kissed by a man, it didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> Not the kiss itself, which was fine. This was on a television show called The Guardian, and it was decided by the writer that I should have an affair with Alan Rosenberg, who was on the thing, and who was a little bit younger than I, but not a whole lot younger than I. And this was 10 years ago, so I was 59, and not beyond, you know, not a lot. So he wrote this whole thing, and it was all great, we were going to have a love affair and everything, and they sent, as they do in the case of this, the script up to the people upstairs at CBS, who um, essentially went, oh. <laughs> And I went to the writer, who was a friend of mine, who was the creator of the show, and I said, they went, oh, didn't they? And he said, yeah, they did. So, so I, we had a rather, one rather chaste kiss, and that was the end of it then. <laughs> then Alan went crazy in the show and I was uh, entirely close. I should have been wearing a burqa. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let her kiss anybody. So I think that that was my worst uh, 
example, and it was the world around, not the kiss itself, because mm -hmm. it was nice the kiss itself. Mm. <laughs> I was, uh, and the non-actors have stories of performing a kiss that, that are fun to share? Well, I, I mean, uh, yeah, first you said the, uh, a kiss on stage, so I thought, you know, a kiss that is in a performance, but then I thought every kiss is a performance. It is a performative act. So then I began to go, like, you know, from age 12 on, you know, very quickly, <laughs> what has been the best, what has been the worst, what have I acquiesced to, what did I wish would never stop, and what did I wish would never have started. <laughs> you know, kind of a, <laughs> I've had every kind of kiss in that sense. But um, I did have one that kind of um, stayed a little longer in my memory uh, zone here, which was um, the first... It's, I don't know where you got the idea that it's a French kiss, you know. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like French fries, you know. It's like, you know, <laughs> first of all, they're Belgian, if you didn't know. But, you know, um, so that first, what you call here French kiss, um, was utterly terrifying. It was like, oh my God, this, like, I was utterly terrified. And, um, and I just remembered, you know, what it's like to have sexual ignorance as part of your sexual education and how much things sometimes start out in a terrifying way and it takes really a while till you actually discover the delight of it. And then when you for the first time actually have that same experience and it becomes something utterly blissful, you understand that in sexuality and in kissing lies two opposites disgust and delight, depending on how it takes place. That's amazing. Oh. Um, I, believe it or not, had one sort of stage kiss. It was a, I guess you could call it a rehearsal kiss. It was in a scene study class when I was 13. Mm -hmm. And I'd never kissed a boy before. Um, and uh, it was with Joyce Piven, who was my teacher, who, she's a wonderful acting teacher, and many people know her now as the mom of Jeremy Piven, but in her own right, she's a wonderful acting teacher. So Murphy and I were doing, um, it was Murphy Monroe, who was the, was the boy, and I forget, A Long Walk to Forever, I think it was, and we were doing the scene, and then Murphy just promptly stuck his tongue in my mouth, and I must have had a look on my face, and Joyce just said, oh, Murphy, you can't, you have to ask permission. <laughs> 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 and clearly I wasn't really cut out for acting um, in any way, but, but I did have one. <laughs> yes. You know, I, I feel like Esther's comment really it frames the, 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 po the polarity between Hamish's story. Uh, on the one hand, it's his 30th birthday and Kathleen's story of being kissed by an angel. And the way in which you know, the kiss is both disruptive but also and I was wondering about being an actor, and in particular, if you're thinking about Kathleen doing this night after night you know, for six years, or more or less six years, how, you know, how much of it sort of happens organically? Like, is your experience that you sort of fall into it, or, is it, or do you really think about it, and how technical is it? Well, it's a very interesting thing that I've begun to discover now more and more. I've long suspected that the, when, there's a time when you get the whole play inside you, and then you don't have to think about it anymore. And I long suspected that it's stored not in the regular memory part, but in the muscle memory part. Because when it's inside you like that, you've finally gotten the, what's going on on the stage up to the speed of human thought. Because that's the enterprise, actually. You begin, you know, it's just endless forever and ever. And then, and when it's up to the speed of human thought and it's stored properly in your muscle memory, it's great because you, you, you can subvert it and get control of it and that usually messes it up. Or you can do it, it's like as you were saying, like Michael Jackson, like downhill skiing. You just jump off at the beginning and go all, just go through it and it unfolds. And it's not as though you're unconscious, you know, you do, you have control over it, but it unfolds like, um, it, as though it's something in your muscle How memory. How long does muscle memory take on stage, would you say a year? No, it doesn't, it takes, it, you, I think, I, it's odd now, because I'm just now at this stage, because I'm just about play that I'm in, which is about to open on tomorrow. And so we've we've been we've finished all the 
horrible stages, and we've just been through the judging, which is the bad stage, the judging, and then after Wednesday, when they say what they thought, it won't matter anymore, and then we can really do the play. But, <laughs> but the m muscle memory now, for me, kicks in sometime after the first week of previews, okay. when you play it, once you get the thing in your head. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about doing a play over a long period of time, even if it's in development, or especially if it's in development, is that there are sections of it that are in your muscle memory or in your lizard brain, you know, back here, that you can, you know, uh, that act as a kind of touchstone mm -hmm. for the rest of it. But it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful moment when you realize you don't have to think about it anymore. You can just start and the thing will come out, which is not to say that it will always come out in the most stunning possible way. But the best thing to do mm -hmm. is let it come out, because you, if, once you get close to that place and you try to control it, you get in the way, then it, it, it stutters. Mm. It doesn't, it, it's, it's bad. You slow it down in the same way that, and you see that a lot in sports. People get in their own way. You just have to, you have to believe at some point that it's okay, and if it's all been prepared properly and it's been properly directed and all like that, and the other person that is alive in the same way, then it's, it's great. And you don't, you know, the, in, the events unfold as though they, as the way they unfold in life, but only short. Can I ask another a, a question too about the automatic and time? Because I remember you and I were talking once about um, oxytocin maybe, um, and uh, the idea that the rehearsal period usually is about three to four weeks, which is what the natural period, I can't remember what this conversation was exactly about, but um, it had to do with science and neurobiology, and I was, I was interested that you said it becomes bodily and it becomes automatic, and I mean, I wonder if there's a sense in which the rehearsal period mirrors the um, the, the, the time of first love where your hormones are kind of raging and then you go into a year to six year run and it becomes automatic in the way that a marriage does. And so automatic <laughs> not in a bad, I think not in a bad way. In the best way. In the best not, way. And not even automatic, just that it's stored in a different place so there are things you don't have to think about. Mm -hmm. Yes, but you are emphasizing unfolding and not repetition. Mm. Unfolding is erotic. Repetition kills it. Right. Um, <laughs> it's true. And That's the difference, difference between the stage and the stage. If it <laughs> unfolds, if you, if every day it unfolds, then it's not, re it's not That's repetition correct. control. That's correct. It's but I think, but I do think in a play, I mean, I, I, I think a way of thinking about kissing is like language or like any movement, but you're trying to, if you think of it in terms of intention and trying to pursue your objective and this being a tool that your character has been given to achieve something story-wise in a scene, night after night, and if you are every night investing in your intentions and trying to get your characters, what your character wants across, then that kiss is is one of your tools so you were i mean it is i'm trying to achieve my objective with this kiss and so it is i mean it isn't i mean you're working every night yeah. to tell your character's story and find that thing so can i ask also then about i i i'm not a writer who works with objective and intention at all mm -hmm. and i'm fine if an actor decides that's how they like to work but it's not how i work when i'm writing I mean, do you think there's a difference between desire on stage and objective? And also in your work, do you think there's a difference between desire and that, a certain kind of intention? Do you mean like planning or like, like goal-oriented? Goal-oriented, a goal-oriented intention. Well, I think, it's I think it's really hard to try to perform desire. I mean, it's very hard to try to perform uh, uh, a result, you know, it's very, e it, 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 you know, uh, to be gobsmacked, to be, you know, like, just like stuck, to, to play a state is very hard to do, but do I you think, agree, Kathy? yeah, but desire, you see, is not a state, desire, desire by its very nature 
has a has a is is forward moving and is a process it's desire for something and people who are overwhelmed with desire for whatever it is they're overwhelmed with desire for behave in a particular way so i think i think however it i however we do people act people move forward through time and uh, i think sometimes it's it's reductive to say just objective or just desire yep. it is we the characters are the people who do this thing the, the you know they say this and do it <laughs> I, think it, I think it's very, it's just very hard, I mean, there's sort of a lot of shorthand sort of things, but if you say to someone, you need to say to an actor, you need to act like you're more in love with that person. Mm -hmm. That's hard. That's hard, and also, if you, if you do it really good once, chances are it's hard to repeat night after night after night. That's going to be On the other hard. hand, if somebody says to you, you don't love them enough, uh, yeah. then that's... That's some way you. It's a different. You set up like an obstacle. It's a different way. That the what you said because the director. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. The director is saying, "I what I'm getting from you is that you don't love that person enough. It doesn't matter. You know, the the actor's intention may well be that they love them more than life itself. But whatever it is they're doing, what is not expressing that thing. So you you I can be told that you haven't pulled it off." And then you try to figure out and say, "Oh, I see what the problem is." Esther, and what then were you going to gonna say wait, about? You, you have something about telos and sort of desire that you talk about. Well, I mean, your question about the difference between desire and objective is is actually um, they go hand in hand. Desire is to own the wanting. So if you want, you are propelled towards something. And you can never force people to want. You can force them to do, but not to want. This is certainly true in sex, and or in kissing, for that matter. And um, so, it always has the, the the implication of acting, agir, is implied in it. And desire is desiderare. I mean, they they are completely intertwined from a from an experiential point of view. I'm not talking now neurobiologically and all of that, but experientially they are completely intertwined, and they have a movement towards. I mean, in desire, there is a, a movement toward. But what's more interesting, and that's why the sentence, you don't love enough, works so well, is that desire is intensified by obstacles. That's, that is actually, you know, um, and, and, on, and, in, and in the kiss, if you want, you could say that attraction plus obstacle equals excitement. That's the erotic. <laughs> And our job... That's an erotic formula for Our job, you know, <laughs> is, is not... <laughs> our job is not actually to feel that. It's to make you think that we do. And so it doesn't matter how you do it. Right. Well, and how often do you feel it? Well, it depends on who's on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> As a woman who has been married since the beginning of the mists of time... <laughs> Often. No, but, do, <laughs> but do you have the feeling that when you do it on stage, in a way, even if it has become part of your muscle memory and you inhabit the role, there is a way in which it's never acquired, right? It's I never acquired. Mm -hmm. It's never taken for granted. Oh, no, no, no. So that is the difference between the stage kiss and the offstage kiss, is that it's never acquired on stage, because you never know for sure if you will have succeeded in inducing that feeling in the spectator. And so every time is a first time. Yeah. yeah. Voila, and at home it's not like that. Because, <laughs> of, the <laughs> because of the spectator. Well, I was wondering, I mean, do you think that, I mean, as actors, do you, can you take this erotic experience and this sort of intelligence home with it? Does it, does it enhance your life off stage? <laughs> I mean, in any way. It's a very An tricky, answer. <laughs> very tricky, the, the line between what you do here and what you do at home and how they live. As you see in the play. Yeah, yeah. I think there's some, you have a really lovely line, there's a perfect line about the difference between, what is it, and it's so perfect that I've forgotten it, the, uh, the, one, the, the difference between romance and, I mean, there, that there is like, there is a romance to, and to, to 
the, to the romances that you put on on stage. And it does become part of your muscle memory. Actually, the, long, the longer you do it, the more times you do it, you're like, oh, I'm going through these stages of this contained thing, which is, you know, it, it's, it's a thing, but it does exist in a snow globe a little bit. And then, uh, I mean, the snow globes pop sometimes, I guess. Then you get a mess on your desk. <laughs> uh, but, but but they but they but they are but they are so, they are sort of like they're different they're, they're different beats. I love the image of a snow globe though the yeah. idea that it's sort of self contained. You can have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, now that you're a playwright, you should have it. That's <laughs> right. <Sorry. laughs> yes, it is. Um, what was I, gonna, I was thinking when you were talking about the snow globe and and all of that. The the time that it becomes dangerous as a workplace at thing is when it goes bad and the play isn't over. Mm. <laughs> and that, yeah. that is when your craft is called upon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, oh, yeah, there was this one time <laughs> in, in Maine when I was a boy. And uh, yeah, there, was, there were a couple nights when Juliet really fucking hated Romeo. It was bizarre. It's like it went on for a while, and the play doesn't work so well now. <laughs> and you were wrong. Yet? He's dead. Uh, good. Yeah, Thank yeah, God yeah, I can yeah, get yeah, out. Yeah. Like yeah. Well, and in that situation, is how do you how do you recover? Like what? I mean, is it a, is it a director? <laughs> you don't sometimes, but sometimes Portland has a bad run. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that I saw it early on. It was great. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Because I guess I wonder, I wonder if Esther listening to the two actors talking about sort of channeling an erotic sense with success or failure on stage, does that, does that resonate with, with sort of your experience with people sort of out in the world who are struggling in their relationship? To channel it while on stage or to be able to bring the energy off stage? Well, I guess both. Like, I, I wonder, are there other ways that it, that it seems like what they're, what they're channeling on stage is what people aspire to, or is it? Or does it just seem like it can only exist? Oh on yes, stage? of course. That's why we go to the theater. That's why we go to the we go to the movies. That's why we read novels. I mean, romance comes from a roman. It's the it's the plot that unfolds over time, and you want that plot to unfold really slowly. You know, you don't want to get to the end so fast because because then it's over. You just want that suspension. You want to go with it. You want all the disappointments, all the almost, but not really, but it could have been, but then it didn't happen, and then it finally did happen. <laughs> I mean, come on, you are ringing like this, you know? Um, but I think that to bring that energy off stage uh, is a different story. I mean, the, this is an act of the imagination, and the people who bring it the best off stage are the people who are able to understand that thing called the erotic, as an act of the imagination. It is the central agent of the erotic. And sometimes we have a harder time maintaining that imagination in our everyday life. We go outside of our everyday life to throw ourselves, to surrender to that imaginative space. We don't bring it into the ordinary. But when we do, it's magnificent. Mm. How do you do it? I mean, how do you tell your patients to do it? <laughs> What's the nitty gritty? Well, I often suggest first, to, you know, there's lots of things, but I, I, I'm very influenced by theatre in that way because I believe that it is a theatrical, it's a production, it's a pretend, it's a play. And, um, and so I think one of the most freeing things sometimes is just to change names. I mean, you know, to be called the same name by the same person for decades. It's just like, you know, it doesn't open up many possibilities and sometimes just to change names, you know, is a, is a very, it's like theater. I mean, you play a character, you know, the children know that from the, from the beginning. They understand the idea of leaving themselves to enter another, another self or other parts of oneself that we don't typically access. That's why people go and find other lovers in the first place too. Not so much because they're looking for another person, they're looking for another self. They're looking to be something else than what they have become, which often can be rather stifling. So um, anything that's disruptive of the everyday, anything that's subversive, anything that breaks rules, anything that takes you outside of your proper responsible management ink kind of thing, <laughs> any of that that is playful, utterly playful. I think the two key experiences are playfulness and curiosity. Mm. Because the absence of imagination is the death of curiosity. 
Well, you know, that's, that's a lot to digest, but it, but it makes me angry. I did rehearse this. It's different from the actor. I can see that you, that you, you live with this day in and day out. But this theme of, like, of playfulness in the imagination, um, I mean, this is, I guess, supposed to be absurd. It really seems central to the structure of stage kiss. That the, yes. That in the first act, there is this sort of, this loving, funny farce about staging love in imagination on stage. And then the second act shifts, and it's much more about the serious work of trying to love someone in real life. And I wonder uh, sort of what, what that contrast is about for you. It's so surreal in a way to be asked this by my husband. I love it. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I think the, the first act is, is silly purposefully, and I sometimes liken my plays to mixed genres because I feel like laughter opens people, and if you crack them open a little bit, then they might be ready for a second act where there might be more seriousness of purpose. Um, not that I don't think laughter is, is, is a seriousness of purpose unto itself, but I think for me the, the end of the play is about this question of marriage being a non-narrative expression of love, that it has a dailiness and a repetition. And so um, it's not like what we often see on stage, the, un the unfolding of plot, because by definition, romances end. And of course, marriages end because somebody dies. Um, and they can end in other ways too. Everything has a natural end, but I was thinking about marriage as, in a certain sense, inherently anti-theatrical or unstageable. And um, so that, that was the, the question that creeps in at the end of the play, is after this whole play where you're laughing and watching illusions get created and sort of the absurdity of how we create illusions on stage, how do you live with a very simple, um, in a very simple way with another person over time? But the greatest twist in the play is that the husband stages <laughs> through the theatricality the total ordinary deadness. I mean, the fact that he actually engineers it and that they then land, you know, leaving the stage and becoming, you know, the marital boredom, <coughs> but created by, by him in the theater, that twist is just really. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, I hope it's surprising. I never really know how I'm going to end a play until I end it. So I'm always hopeful that in the, in the act of discovering it while I'm writing, there's some sense of discovery for the audience over time. So okay. I wonder, I mean, when you, when you refer you to characterize it as anti-theatrical, because, the, because, it, I, because I wonder more about this, that, see, because when you're married, you just don't have time to talk about it. <laughs> no, um, we have a babysitter. That's <laughs> true. Um, <laughs> I don't think it's the majority, but yes, it's a, um, but the first thing is it's willful, it's intentional, it's premeditated. It's not something that just happens to you in this kind of, you know, unbeknownst way, you know, a kind of a deus ex machina that falls from the heaven while you fall in the laundry. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's much more, um, it, it, you really need to make the effort to remain attentive to the other person, to remain curious, not to think that they are inside of your pocket to actually imagine that you don't know them, that they don't belong to you, that they're just unknown with an option to renew. But that's mm -hmm. about it, you know? And that, and that is an anxiety that people are willing to tolerate in the artifice of theater and art, and that they don't always want to tolerate in the reality of their everyday life. Mm -hmm. They like to think, you know, you're there, like a comfortable piece of furniture, and I can just kind of collapse, and I don't have to do anything anymore. 
And that is the least engaging thing. So they do a lot everywhere else in their life, but when they come home, they plop. You know, they take off their nice clothes which they have in the world. They take off their nice behavior which they have when they go out in the world. And they leave the leftover for the person that they're with. And that's not particularly engaging. Mm. So if you turn it around, what happens often in long-term relationships is that the romance kind of stops when the commitment begins. The plot is over. Mm. The story is over. That's it. It's like, I don't have to make the effort anymore. I don't have to romance. I don't have to seduce. I don't have to. I don't have to. Because <laughs> you're there. Because I got you. I mean, this kind of, so it's that thing that is very difficult to, to, to be willing to be committed to, that no, you could lose that person any moment if you don't do what it <coughs> takes to really keep them involved, engaged, you know. Um, I mean, there's so much to say about that, that act itself. Um, but I think other people have well, I was <laughs> There was another part of the play that, I've had, that has to do with me. I've been married since to the same person since 1966. So I just realized that in two years I will have been married 50 years. I've been married since I was 21 to the same person. And as they say in the line in winter, every family has its ups and downs. So there are all of those things. But one of the things that I found from this, and I'm finding that this part of it is working uh, better than the other part the part before. I like this part, the, this the last few, however many years. But one of the things that I found so moving in the play was the thing that did happen to her, which was that all of a sudden, in the middle of all the romance and everything, she missed home. And there are some people who are meant to be married, and I think some people who aren't. And it was the it was the moment in the play when you knew that the pull, however, however strong the erotic pull of romance and the adventure and all like that was, that there was some deep thing in here that would that had that in which she was attached to Danny's character and to the truth of their family that lived no matter what the romance was. And I, I, I just, I was so, I'm, my heart left. And it was odd because I was saw, seeing it with my daughter who's in the middle of her life. She's been married and has a child now and we had, we responded to it in different ways because she's in a different part of the, of the history of this thing. Because marriages, if you're lucky enough to have one that goes on for a long time, or not, like whatever. As we say, it's ups and downs. Has uh, uh, there are ages of it, shapes of it. The whole purpose of it changes after a while. You know, if you you think you, a, a, and what constitutes romance in it, and what constitutes working at it changes as it. So you know, one of the ways I say is that most of us today in the West are going to have two or three marriages mm -hmm. or committed relationships in our lifetime, and some of us are going to do it with the same person. I think that's exactly that. That's right. Well, I was you know, just thinking about the passage of time, and um, I was, one, I guess maybe the last question I'll ask you guys before you open it up to the audience is, I was, you know, I was wondering about what it's been like over your careers, as, you, as you've also grown up, to, to be kissing or to be, you know, performing sort of sexiness that there, it has a kind of meaning and a kind of quality, that, or at least a stereotypical quality when you're younger. But what's it like to be, to be 20 and then to be 30 and then to be 40 and then to be 50 and then on, mm -hmm. uh, to, to sort of try to perform that? Because I think that is this real challenge for people in long-term relationships too, that the nature of that passion shifts over time. Well, I think the lucky thing is that when you're uh, an actor in your 20s, you're, uh, in your early 20s, uh, you're really trying to have sex with every actress that you're working with. <laughs> and probably every character you are playing in your 20s really is just trying to have sex with whoever they're working with. So the quality of that kiss is very appropriate to the play and to the character at that time. And then your romances and your relationships do become more nuanced and hope uh, in your 30s and 40s. and uh, so. 
you do acquire that, you know, you know, you can do that. You can step back and you can actually try to, actually you become more ambitious, frankly, in your 30s and 40s. And it's more like, I'd really put on, I'd like to put on a good show and not be run out of Portland this time. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I'd like to have more career success. So maybe uh, I'll have a longer view before I step into this embrace. And it's, a, it's an issue, as people always say, for women, because uh, as the people, on, it's more of an issue on the TV, the people on the TV decided that I was hopelessly out of the game by the time I was 60, and it was grotesque to think that I might be involved with it. And, but paradoxically, um, <laughs> since I don't care anymore, <laughs> People are saying things to me now that I'd have killed everybody on my block and the next three blocks <laughs> to hear that I never did because in a way you're, as Amy, you're trying to hard, you have another agenda, you know. So there's a kind of peace if they still let you do it in any way at all. Um, I, I, I've, I'm finding like I've liked, I've really liked. This uh, part of my life, I'm, I was just 69 this year, so I've liked it a lot, certainly for the last 10 years. I mean, after they told me I couldn't kiss Ella Rosen, <laughs> I had to come to grips with that. But, um, uh, and, and it is different, the, the objective is different. Yeah. And so you, in, in a weird way, you get more, the, all the things they tell you that you're supposed to do when you're young and all like in order to succeed in the world, but that only Tilda Swinton seems to know how to do. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to be completely comfortable in yourself and just kind of move forward. Only just as you're teetering on the brink of extinction do they give you this present and say, here, us. <laughs> but then there's Tilda Swinton, who is the She's exception that proves the rule. Yes, she really is. Cool. And a friend of Levin's, by the way. Yes. I've mean, he's had a crush for many years. As, as but then you have the new movie of Catherine Deneuve coming out, yeah. and uh, um, Elle s'en va, I don't know what they call it in English, but um, hopefully as this society matures, uh, an older woman kissing will become uh, just <laughs> as sexual. Um, because it actually, I think the, the to story that is often not told is that it gets much better with age. It gets much better because the quality of the kiss and the experience of the kiss goes hand in hand with our experience of ourselves, our level of self-acceptance, of self-worth, our willingness to be able to ask, to give, to take, to refuse, to, you know, and that these experiences come with maturity. Mm -hmm. Promiscuity or libido is one thing, but the quality of an erotic experience has everything to do with how you experience life as a whole. And that, I think, comes with experience and maturity and a few hard breaks. Mm. So um, I would say um, that the difference also, you know, what you were highlighting is what my, my whole book, Mating in Captivity, is organized around our need for security and our need for adventure. Mm -hmm. And that one of the challenges of modern love is that it's the first time that we want to reconcile in one relationship two basically fundamentally opposed human needs. They were never meant to be together in one place. The same person giving us security and giving us excitement, giving us predictability and giving us edge. And um, I think that there are periods in your life where you attend more to your erotic needs. And then, that's that actor in his 20s. And then there is a period in your life where you attend more to your security needs, to your emotional needs. But they're not always aligned. What is emotionally satisfying is not always a, a turn on. So, it's that dance that you do throughout life. Mm -hmm. And then there comes a place where you don't care anymore. And then you can actually be really free. Well, on that, on that note of liberation. <laughs> um, care about doing the right thing, yeah, yeah. what's expected, what society told you, and yeah. all of that stuff. Yeah. No, liber I think liberation is a good aspiration. And um, but, also. And 30 oh. years with the same age. <laughs> <laughs> I've been kissing a long time for the same <laughs> Um, yeah, well, so maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to the audience, and we'll take some audience questions. Great. Um, so uh, we, uh, we only have one microphone, because we are a nonprofit. 
Uh, so uh, what you're going to see is a, a member of the literary staff will run the microphone to you if you have a question, and we'll pick it up from you after your question. Um, so uh, any, any questions from you guys? From, from oh, here we go. Question, then. Oh, here we go. I have a question for you, Sarah. As a playwright, when you write about a kiss, do you give a stage direction that says there should be a passionate kiss? Or do you say they kiss and leave it up to the director or the agent between the actors? Or do you give more direction? I'm trying to think exactly how I phrased the kisses in this play and the stage directions. I tend to be fairly precise with stage directions and fairly non-adjectival. Um, that is to say, I, I care about the, non and ver the noun and the verb more than I do about the adjective. So I, I doubt I would say they kiss passionately. I don't think I do. Adam, do I? I don't think you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I say they, they kiss, period. I think you, at the most, I think you say like they kiss, it's awkward or something like that. Do. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I do leave leave it very open for the actors and um, and the director. And I think there was only one point in this process where the director had to say, actually, I think there's more tongue here. And that was for the two women. <laughs> <laughs> Another question? Yeah. Um, this goes to, I guess, the whole panel. What do you think is so special about a kiss as opposed to anything else that might be part of an erotic experience? And part of that question, do you think that we sometimes get too hung up on kissing as opposed to anything else that might go along physically? Well, on stage, almost any other form of erotic activity just looks ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas you can actually kiss convincingly and in a, in a variety of ways. It's in, I'm in a play now that has a whole lot of simulated um, um, sex in it, um, done in a very tasteful and beautiful way. So, <laughs> in Vienna in 1920, and it has taken endless, endless amounts of time with the choreographer and and everybody to make it, it's quite beautiful, I think. I don't know, because we just hear it. We just hear it from backstage. What's the name of the play? It's called Tales from Red Vienna. Um, Mini communists? Yeah, because there, uh, nobody was here. But anyway, Vienna <laughs> had a, a socialist, uh, a socialist, was a socialist republic from 1919 to the Anschluss. But anyway, so it's, it's in 1920. But anyhow. Um, um, and the thing about kissing is that kissing is understood, understood as a, a symbol of all the rest of it and is filled with possibility and they're all different kinds and, and it's not uh, grotesque, whereas actually trying to, you know, there are other, there, there are sort of uh, almost all other forms of, of sexual activity at the public uh, action, unless you're really doing them, which you shouldn't probably be doing in the theater, <laughs> or make people laugh and they get all wonder about where their clothes are and why don't they have their clothes on. Do you take your clothes off and how could he button his pants quickly enough and, and where is the sheet and all like that. So kissing is a wonderful erotic shorthand. It's a very good. I mean, it's a very good parallel between sex and violence because when you have uh, violence on stage that is too violent or too scary, like if you have sex on stage which seems too real, the audience gets taken out of it, and uh, so there's like this level of stage combat and stage kissing where everyone can be appropriately on the edge of their seat, titillated, and not be worrying about the actors, and then the actors instead of. Uh, concerned with the characters. So, um, I think that the whole thing is a continuum, the whole sexual experience or erotic experience. And you can have a healing kiss, you can have an affectionate kiss, you can have a sexual kiss, and you can have an erotic kiss. And they have very different meanings and very different um, relationships to the person that is kissing and is being kissed. 
But it is often in sexuality the first invitation inside another person, inside the boundaries of another person. It's the first orifice that you actually enter. And it is enormously powerful. Um, it connects to every other orifice, for that matter. If these lips open, so do these. <laughs> um, you know, it's certainly for, in, in the case of women. And um, it, it just sends an energy all over, throughout your entire body. Um, and that invitation, that permission to come in, to be allowed in, and it is also the only experience of being inside, in the physical sense, that is mutual, where two people are inside each other like that at the same time. And um, be it two men, two women, or men and women, for sure, it's the only time when it actually is utterly mutual. Physiologically, utterly mutual. And androgynous, in a sense. Yes, so that's, that's what, yeah, so I mean, one can say a lot more, but there, that is why the kiss is so um, symbolic and so significant. But any act can be made too big a deal of, or too little a deal of, that also. Um, I actually was curious, because you were both talking about stage kissing and simulated sex on stage, I know there's a, a part in the play where um, the characters are talking about the difference between stage and film. Um, and I was wondering if you, uh, maybe you could expand a little bit more on if you've noticed the difference as actors between the two mediums, or if you feel, if you could expand a little bit more on what you were saying in the play about how it's received differently by the people performing the act and by the people observing it. Well, it, it has a little bit to do with what Kathleen was saying about um, the kiss as, as symbolic, as standing in for everything else on stage. And that on stage, I think you have traffic with metaphor in a very direct way. And in film, you don't necessarily. So you have to see all the machinery. Um, uh, I'm actually curious what you would say, Hamish, because you said you had a sex scene with Miranda July where you were wearing a merkin, or? No, she was wearing the merkin. Yeah, uh, <laughs> okay. she, uh, she, she was like, we're, we're gonna have this sex scene, and um, yeah, I don't know, but uh, you'll be, you know, naked, and I'll have um, the merkin and my cape. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't get a cape. But uh, uh, then, and, and we, it was fun because, it, but this is like an example of something because what we did was we then worked really hard on this sex scene and like we were like let's make a really let's make a really real let's get a let's get a good sex scene up here and so we we're like well what about this move oh well that naturally transitions into that oh well yes and then then you go into the double axle oh well then and then uh, the half Nelson and eventually we shot this ridiculous elaborate sex scene uh, and the and the and then she got to the you know got the rough cut and was watching her movie and then all of a sudden there was a porno. Th th that started playing, which was this sex scene, and the point of the movie was that our characters didn't have sex, and we had sort of forgotten this <laughs> uh, the, the way. Uh, I mean, she had written this that they have, she wrote they have sex or something like that, and it's not good. But we sort of um, put on a different show, um, and, and but it was like the coldest, saddest, the most technical, miserable, frustrating thing shooting it. Because then you have like all those people like walking over your merkin and uh, <laughs> trying to get good focus on your cake. And, uh, it's it's really terribly unsexy. But it's about story. Ultimately, all these acts are about uh -huh. story and about character. And if they're not, then they're not really helping you out. That much. I think one of my favorite I, sex scenes on, on film is have you seen that movie by Sarah Pauly, Take This Wall? Mm. And there's this oh, yes. beautiful long extended sequence where she leaves her sort of ordinary domestic partnership to have this affair and then and, and they're in a room with no furniture in fact um, that I saw it after I wrote this play and so they have sex with no furniture in all kinds of positions and then other lovers are added and all kinds of permutations and positions and then suddenly furniture starts coming in and suddenly they're bored and they've completely replicated um, 
What she just said. What she just left. <laughs> that I, I was, I, I was the reason that Kinsey almost got a triple X ring. Fun with my see. I had to cut some frames out of it, and it was. Uh, I, I wasn't um, allowed to have a merkin actually. Mm -hmm. um, it was very. I was the person with the. Well, I forget what they were called. The, the in the Kinsey the, in the shotgun. Uh, uh, orgasms. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> my, you can't exactly see my face, though my children and their friends did recognize. Wait, <laughs> uh, um, but we had to. It was one. Everybody was so nice. The first, the first thing about it was that they, three, no, four people told Bill Condon, the director, that I would do that. Oh, Kathy will do that. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, when you say shotgun orgasm, do you mean female ejaculation? No, no, it, it, it sound, I mean, yes, but you, I did the sound effect, you didn't see the physical. Oh, I see. Yeah, so, uh, so four people said, oh yeah, Kathy will do that, I'll be fine. And I, I read, well, all right, what the hell. And Bill Condon is a wonderful man. Oh, no one else could have made this movie, Kinsey, but Bill because he managed to make everybody feel very comfortable, so I went out to New Jersey where it was, where it was going on, and um, the day I, 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 had to, I was in a play, so I had to leave um, at a certain point, and the day, as they do in movies, went on and on and on, and so finally it got to be the time, and there, that, so they, it had to be done, this thing that was going to be done with great delicacy, clearing the set and all like that stuff. Didn't happen because there wasn't time. So we all went up into the attic and I, had, or I was naked and the person who was on top of me was uh, <laughs> naked as well. And we, I was quite significantly older than he and we were there and there came a moment when he realized that he was my clothes and that if he got up between Hey, oh. I would be completely exposed to all the people in the thing. So <laughs> we lay there. <like> <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, in the movie, it's a movie that Liam Neeson is showing, but actually Liam Neeson, was, whom I know, was standing in the room while it was going on. Um, being Dr. Kinsey, but we would, we did about three takes of it, not because I was always the technical thing, you know, the camera breaks right at that moment, or there's a hair in the, in the cage, or some other thing, and so in between takes, because he couldn't get up, we would sit and talk to each other about our families. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like making a sex scene is actually deeply unerotic. It's, not, it's deeply, deeply unerotic. I suppose that there are circumstances in which that's not true, but it's such a public event, even in the fa on the famous closed set. There have to be at least ten other people in the room in order to make the thing work. And if they don't happen to be in the room, you know they're down the hall at the monitor watching the picture, then listening to the sound and saying, that's not working out so well, is it? Could you move on? Here One thing I, I want to ask about that is just because what you were saying earlier, Esther, about the, the spectators creating a kind of <coughs> vitality and erotic energy on stage. Kathleen, you're saying that the spectators <laughs> on the set create exactly the opposite. They opposite because they're not spectators. They're involved in it. It's a professional, you know, the, 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 uh, the thing to, that you're supposed to be doing is to create a thing that does exactly the same thing, that causes erotic feelings or whatever in the audience. But you don't, the people who are there shouldn't but I feel think that it, way. But I think it's also the nature, <laughs> the difference between do, doing a play and, do, and doing the stop start of making a movie, which is just like you're not doing, I mean, I think the reason that perhaps a lot of romances that start on stage don't continue afterwards is they start as a three-way. 
i mean these people are part of that relationship and when you do that kiss off stage there's no there's no witness there's no third party there's no you're not telling a story anymore with that kiss it's just it's it's a different it's a very different game um and so i think that's why i i call it the shadow of the third yes yeah yeah but the movies of the movies it's just like it's a job yeah on the other end from a spectator point of view i think that that what you described before that if the stage is too violent or too raw sexual that it actually kind of that you don't the screen gives you that kind of exactly that it screens between you and the action and so it allows you to actually um, surrender much more to what goes on than you can do when you run in the theater. I doubt that people get turned on watching a play like people get turned on when they watch a movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and perversely also, I mean, like when you're talking about the whether you use tongue and the kissing and stuff like that, it's just not necessary on stage. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't see it. But in a close-up, you know, mm-hmm. when you see that that's little right. darting tongue, that's like, oh, they really like each other, and that's sort of like <laughs> part of it's part of the currency because that's what the medium is. But it's less sexy actually making that than uh, than you would think. Than being on the screen. Yeah. Another question? Um, so uh, we've been talking a bit, um, actually all night, about um, the pleasures and the joys that come from kissing and, and sex and so on. Um, and then I guess I was just sort of curious, um, what um, information or um, uh, what, what information exists about um, uh, what happens when people who are too young, like children, kiss or have sex? Um, you know, my instincts tell me that there's an age before which kids shouldn't be having sex. Um, I'm curious if there's you know, research that's been done um, that informs us about what dangers, if any, exist when that happens. Um, and then, if there is a sort of break-off age, what age is it when the human psyche can safely engage in kissing and sex and stuff like that? I'm just going to refer this to Tony, the child. Yeah, maybe the child the psychologist. <laughs> well, I, you know, I wonder if, I mean, another way to maybe paraphrase that question is to ask about uh, you know, what is, what is the difference between playing and love and doing it? Because I think that it's certainly true, right, that, that children are physical, they're sensual, you know, you know, kids when they're in kindergarten and first grade play the kissing game with a kissing bandit and they sort of enact, sort of chasing each other around. And, um, and so there's something about, so it seems that, I think one way to think about your question is that there's something about being able to play, which requires safety, and that when an act stops stops being playful, it also sort of stops being safe. And I, you know, and I think that one of the continuities between the experience of children and of adults, in a, with that to be good, is if if this sort of ability to have a sense of playfulness can be sustained. Um, but so I guess I wonder, you know, I wonder maybe to to shift this to thinking about. Like Esther's work, um, and I think also in terms of like thinking about the, like theatricality, um, like how do you how do you make it safe to play? Like how does how does that happen for married couples, or how does it happen you know on stage when you're asking people to do things that are really difficult? Like what's important? What 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 makes what facilitates playfulness kind of emerging? Well, maybe we should understand what does it mean when we say that safety produces play, right? Um, you can look at it in reverse. One thing about your question, we do all kinds of sexual things long before we know they are sexual. We touch ourselves, we play with ourselves, we soothe ourselves, but it doesn't have that meaning yet. So there, what changes it is the meaning of it what changes it is when adults who are meant to make you feel safe actually violate you. That's all of those things. So what is the, you know, to play is to enter a state of unselfconsciousness. Is to enter a state that has pleasure for its own sake. 
is to enter a state that is very liberating because you are able to step outside of your boundaries, outside of your familiarity of who you are. This is true at all ages. In order to be able to do that, you have to feel safe. So safe means that you know that when you've taken a, uh, that when you've gone off into flight, into fantasy land, into imaginative space, that when you come back, reality still holds. If you don't know that reality will hold when you've gone off a little bit, then you don't leave it. Then you stay glued to the to the to the home if you want, to the base, because you don't know that it is that if you come, if you leave, you can come back. So the, the, you have to imagine play is a departure from. And in order to leave, you have to know that you can safely come back. Mm -hmm. That's probably one of the best ways to say it. If you are in a state of vigilance, if you feel scared, if you worry that something bad is going to happen to you, to the people that are meant to make you feel safe, all of that, then you stay like this, then you stay on guard, then you stay in that, you know, because, because if I let, let go of being worried, of being watchful, of being careful, of being, you know, vigilant, because I'm going off to play, something terrible could happen. So by definition, the antidote of play is anxiety, worry, fear, vigilance. You cannot do both at the same time. I cannot be making sure that everything is okay and go off. Because once I've gone off, something could have happened here that could have been not okay. It's that tension. Hmm. And how do we learn to play? As a child, one of the ways you learn to play is somebody says, go kid, there's a great thing out there. The world's a fascinating place. Go to explore and to discover. Playfulness goes with exploration and discovery. It's that side of our needs. And as an adult, it's the same. Go, have fun, you know, have a nice time tonight. That's very different than if you go out and the other one says, again we have to go? You know, what's so interesting out there? You never want to be with it. Why don't we ever do this? You know, that's a whole different dynamic. That's a surveillance system. That's not a playful place. And it's, you know, play is not playing with toys. Play is not about sex toys. Play is not about tricks. Play is a state of mind. It's, it's really being unbounded. Mm -hmm. and, um, and for some of us that means being completely inside ourselves and for some of us it means totally leaving ourselves. It goes in both directions. I mean, that's just as a yeah. start. No. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we saw the play last weekend and we loved it, had time to digest it, and which is another mark of a good play. So there are the, 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 the tale in the two levels of this erotic woman who is just so powerful and, and almost shocking to the environment uh, ends in many great plays and movies with the woman going off to pursue whatever the romantic thing is. In this story, she's brought back, rather partially even, to be turned a whore in the third mini-play. And I was just wondering, you know, if, if, you, if you thought about the, the, the choice of which way, because I genuinely we generally didn't know which way this was going to go at intermission, and I'm just wondering if you made a, a conscious choice or if this was just, this is where it felt it had to end. I too didn't know which way it was going to go at intermission. You know, after I wrote the act one, I had no idea what act two would be. And I think in terms of what Esther was saying about play being freedom from, unself, from self-consciousness, that... Um, I don't know, I don't make a conscious choice. I follow the character, the character hopefully talks. Um, so somehow they landed in a horror play. And I, I'm not a great <laughs> fan of horror plays. There's like so many horror plays, so I thought I'd write my own. Um, uh, you know, in, in a doll's house, Nora slammed the door and it was the great sound of the door slam that was heard across the world, that, that sort of leave taking of the home. And this does a totally different thing where she, she goes back home. But um, 
I was so happy in this production to have found that she she leaves the site of the war play and she's supposed to be killed in a rain of bullets and she just she just walks out and waves <laughs> and she leaves. Um, partly because I do think rains of bullets and blood on stage are so funny. Um, but in answer to your question, um, <laughs> um, you were asking me, was it a conscious choice to have her go home? I suppose it was. Um, I suppose I was, I was trying to say something about illusion and love, and I think that he, the, the, the guy she's with for most of the play, who we see her be with, he is the kind of projection and fantasy and person from her past, and the past kind of walks into her present and rematerializes, but that actually she's quite in love with her husband. So the happy ending for her is to go back and be with her husband. And sometimes um, I like a happy ending, and sometimes I like a sad ending, but what I tend to not like as much are ambivalent endings where it ends and the light goes down and the character's sort of hopping on one foot. And even though I love the mixing of genres, sometimes I think something we can learn from genre is the satisfaction of, um, and the lack of fear of a, of a truly happy ending or, or a tragedy where there's, there's no happiness, there's no hope to be found. Um, I think narratively both are deeply satisfying and I wanted to give this woman a happy ending. But it would have been interesting if the men went home. Mm -hmm. We are accustomed to the women going home, more. So there is a gender story here as mm -hmm. well. Um, you know, ultimately, she goes safe. But we don't know if she goes home because it's home and safe or because she actually realized that the other stuff is an illusion and that, you know, um, if you replace um, fiction with reality, you just replace one illusion with another. <laughs> that is a great way to end your panel. <laughs> Yes, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for a great play and a great panel. Thanks. Have a great night.